Коллеги, я прошу проходить. Коллеги, please take your seats. We are about to resume in 30 seconds. Please take your seats. Shall we start? Yes. Okay, colleagues, we are opening the second panel discussion of our International Scientific Conference um, Alexander Zinoviev, uh, the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the Great Russian Revolution, the geopolitical evaluation. It seems to me that in the first part of our discussion, there was a number of very important statements, which I would like to mention once again now. And uh, this uh, is uh, directly involving our current work. First of all, many speakers said that we do not understand what's happening in the world right now. We are lagging behind uh, in our understanding of uh, what's happening. Julieta Geze, in particular, said that we need to interpret the world. Julieta Chiesa said that we need to establish uh, a kind uh, of uh, uh, an expert center. And uh, another important statement was made by Kulikov, who said that, according to Karl Marx, maybe, we cannot know the truth about what has happened after many decades. If we want to survive, if we want to live further, we need to understand the truth right now. This is how I, I understood Kulikov. This is not a question to be postponed for a lot of time. And what is going to happen with us depends very much, among other things, on how we can deal with this topic, how well we can sort it out. So what happened in 1917, in October 1917? How can we understand it? And if we understand it, then, as far as I understood uh, the speakers of uh, the first panel discussion, then we will understand a lot about ourselves, about what's happening now. Todor Todorov, our colleague from Bulgaria, talked about the eventfulness and the need to change the logic. This is how I understood him, at least. If uh, an event happened, then we try to interpret it, to understand it. But now we need to change the logic. We need to create those events by ourselves uh, in accordance with uh, our way of thinking. And this is uh, what I suggest right now. Let's try, without postponing something for a hundred years, uh, to really understand something on the theme that was mentioned. Sergei, you have the floor. You will be the first speaker now. Sergei Zhelizniak, deputy of the Russian State Duma, our colleague and uh, comrade, a long-standing participant of the Zinoviev Club. And I would say that uh, I'm thinking along the same lines. I'm a kind of companion, so to say. Dear colleagues, uh, we really analyze uh, the works uh, of Alexander Zinoviev because of the 95th anniversary since his birth. And we are thinking very seriously about the events that happened in Russia 100 years ago. And um, we can find a lot of interconnections uh, simultaneously in those events which have a very serious overlap along with contrasts. Of course, 
Alexander Zinoviev considered the revolution that happened uh, to be an event of great scale, a watershed event, because in terms of civilizational experiment, this was a unique, unprecedented, and unthought of format, which was implemented on one-fifth of the area of the Earth. And I would say that no one, except for our people, would not be able to handle this task. This is Russia's destiny to try those experiments, and other peoples will form conclusions and uh, create prospects on the basis of this. And this is a very painful and complex experience. This is uh, the pioneering process of the Russian civilization, which is uh, underestimated and underrated even now. And Alexander Zinoviev uh, repeated many times in his works that we need to understand it, because we cannot create something new until you don't understand what you don't like and what exists already. This is why the things that happened after revolution seemed to be like that, but uh, actually they were quite different. And Mr. Zinoviev thought that what the Soviet elite uh, did with the idea of creating the Soviet state was treason. And I would add the following thing. Of course, this was a unique, huge experiment that resulted in a lot of events that we are proud of that would be impossible without that. But that huge number of victims that uh, resulted uh, from the attempt to create this is the price that we can't afford, in my opinion. And now there is a simple dilemma. Which is better, evolution or revolution? If we look at all the revolutions in the world, not just the Russian Revolution, they were all connected with a huge loss of the human resource, time, a lot of uh, other potential resources, capital, in order to launch a new process. That's the revolution which starts with the full destruction of what existed before that. It doesn't start from scratch. A revolution starts from a huge minus because uh, it destroyed the civilization that existed in the previous period. And evolution is much more comfortable, much more sparing way of uh, advancement of the movement forward. And in the 21st century, I do not advise anyone to wait for a revolution. It's much smarter for the elite to contribute to evolutionary changes in the society. Even more so since uh, those uh, evolutionary changes uh, are happening faster and faster right now. Let's uh, think about the world that existed 10 years ago. It's very different from what we have now. And this uh, is not connected with any economic or political changes. Uh, we all world in an information world. We all live in this world where the opinion of one person becomes available to the entire world immediately. And Alexander Zinoviev could only dream of uh, getting his ideas across so quickly. And even though his books have been translated into dozens of languages, he didn't have this opportunity to be instantly available globally. He didn't have this opportunity. And um, this results in another aspect, which uh, is still underrated today. This is the issue of responsibility for what you said. Because before any revolutionary or evolutionary action, there are words. The word was the first, as said in the Bible. Because first, you need uh, to start an idea, and then this idea will be implemented. And the huge 
constraint today, even a destructive factor, is the irresponsible use of words, irresponsible use of what the modern technologies and communications allow us. At the same time, most of the challenges faced by the humanity today are of a global nature initially. They can't be resolved by an individual country. If we talk about climate change, or the international distribution of labor, or opposing international terrorism, these are tasks that cannot be resolved within any single state. If, even if it's a democratic state, uh, because we need to join our forces to do this. And this is what uh, Alexander Zinoviev wanted. In each of his books, he called for this interaction, for this cooperation and partnership, because it's only together that we can meet those challenges. Right now, we are using this word, uh, Zeno and Hell. And uh, this word, is uh, a key word uh, in Zinoviev's heritage because this is one of those key notions which sets us apart uh, from what uh, they are trying to make us do. Because if we look at the Western ideology that is impinged on us, it has uh, the logic of uh, egoism, of personal success, personal accumulation of resources, uh, and everything is measured with this personal success. But at the same time, we cannot launch an international space station, a nuclear reactor, an Andron collider. We can't build it alone. Even the most successful person can't do this. There should be a team. There should be this uh, Xeno and Hell, which will enable everyone to use his or her potential for the common success. And that's the most important thing which we need to use uh, to honor the 100th anniversary of the Great October Revolution. If uh, the elites had not disrupted the country back then, if they hadn't tried uh, to just score points, but if uh, they had tried to do what would be best for the country, then there wouldn't have been the October Revolution in the form which happened. Of course, uh, we can't use the conjunctive mood uh, in history, but uh, maybe our achievements would have been much greater because we are a country of unique human potential, of uh, unique destiny, in terms of civilization, and this is why we are needed for humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. Just one specifying question, if I may, to specify your position. This terrible price paid by our people, by the country, for this revolutionary process you mentioned. So what do you think? Is this the price of the February Revolution or the October Revolution? Without a shadow of a doubt, the October Revolution would not have happened in such a form but for the February Revolution. And the February Revolution, to a large extent, was the revolution of treason of the elites, while the October Revolution was the revolution of uh, getting the power at the background of uh, full anarchy and refusal of elites uh, for responsibility for the country. The Bolsheviks at that time just picked the power that uh, no one had, that was just lying on the ground. And in this regard, I want to say that when we talk about repressions, and we need to remember about uh, repressions uh, even in connection with the February Revolution, because uh, they started at that particular moment when there was a um, uh, full there was a lot of repression, and the consequences of the February Revolution resulted in terrible terror, uh, which happened after the October Revolution. We could have made those historical changes differently. I'm sure we could, but 
For that, we needed to ensure cooperation in the entire society. It should not have been the clash of ambitions, but the factors bringing the society together. If you look at the historical materials about the February Revolution and the months that followed, the degree of uh, the drop of respect to the word, to the power, was catastrophic. So it's even a miracle how much we were able to preserve the country after October, because the country was just on the brink of collapse. If we take the countries uh, that uh, that uh, isolated, that got isolated from the Soviet Union at the beginning of the 21st century, at the end of the 20th century, but the country could just collapse completely at uh, that time during the revolution. So what was done was a fast reaction to that collapse of uh, the February power. If uh, what happened in February hadn't happened in February, then there would be a completely different chain of events. Thank you very much. If I understood you correctly, you mentioned that all those sacrifices, uh, the victims uh, of the civil war, were the consequences of the revolutionary process. And on the other hand, it was an attempt to really stop this process. Is that what you meant? No, the re revolutionary process um, was, uh, there was no attempt to stop it. There was the attempt to channel it into the constructive area in order to create something. And I've talked about it at different platforms. The power can be different, but the power should be strong. Because if the government is weak, the consequences are disastrous. And uh, it's uh, through the price of huge blood that those consequences uh, are stopped. Just one phrase, if I may. We are all well aware that when someone is hysterical, it's really inevitable to give slaps to this person, to pour some cold water on this person. And Russia in 1917 was not just one hysterical person, it was the entire hysterical country which was throwing tantrums in that political context. And we need to bring we needed to bring this country back to sense. So I fully support you. One historical fact which is very indicative. Since February till October 1917, most categories of food product uh, were not uh, produced or used or consumed or were hardly produced and, and consumed. There were long queues. And the only thing that was consumed more were sunflower seeds. Sunflower feeds were used to a greater extent. That's the only product. And for me, those sunflower seeds are another sign of this passive majority that allows the events that are happening to happen, even if uh, they have disastrous consequences for this majority. Which is why many authors have written about the fact that uh, it's uh, the impassiveness, uh, which is the scariest thing. We need a lot of uh, our citizens to be involved in what is happening so that they are not just passive audience, not just those uh, who consume those sunflower seeds. They need to be active participants in the changes that are necessary for the country and for the people. Thank you. So I'm looking forward to the next presentation. Unfortunately, I do not uh, know your name, but you represent the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, so I'm intrigued uh, what can uh, the party say uh, on the centenary of the revolution. My name is uh, Dmitry Novikov, I'm a member of the State Duma, the lower house of the Russian parliament. Uh, 
there is a lot of uh, rubbish in our media space and very little thought and analysis about the revolution so it's very important that the Zinoviev club and uh, Miss uh, Olga Mironova in her activities do a great deal to overcome this lack of analysis and thought and we would like to thank the organizers of this conference for its efforts and the Communist Party respects very much your activities and is looking forward to working with you as for the revolution that happened one centenary ago we have a youth wing within our party I will and we have a youth uh, session here, so we will, I will not elaborate on the history of the revolution and how this history was written over the last 100 years. I would like uh, to say something about what I heard during the first session about the October Revolution. The October Revolution, its history will remind us that uh, the Russian civilization peaked uh, during the Soviet uh, regime and it is also goes for Kazakhstan, for Georgia, for uh, Central Asian countries and uh, the Soviet identity was not something that uh, was uh, uh, conceived by academics, it really existed, this concept. Uh, yes, of course, there could be nationalism within the Soviet Union, but inter-ethnic conflicts were impossible within the Soviet Union in the way that we see it in different parts of the world today. And on the former Soviet Union space, uh, uh, we see that people who are now Ukrainians, they're ready to fight uh, in Donbass against Russian people. And as was mentioned during the first session, uh, uh, so Donbass was mentioned in the first session. Um, uh, and the Communist Party of Ukraine, Ukraine was mentioned. It is now facing very challenging times. Maybe you know that there is a ban on its activity. It has not been enforced, fully enforced. Uh, there is still some space for appeal. And Mr. Simonenko, the head of Ukrainian Communist Party, continues uh, to uh, uh, speak out. He spoke out in Brussels and he put forth uh, f uh, arguments about the violation of political rights, of the freedoms, political freedoms, and about double standards uh, when the norms of international law are violated. And and the Communist Party says that when the allies of the European Union violate international norm, nobody looks at it. And what is happening in Donetsk and Lugansk republics? Uh, the Com Communist Party of Russia is probably the only parliamentarian party that has officially uh, uh, called for the recognition of the safe proclaimed republics uh, only yesterday from a collective farm uh, in the Moscow region we sent the 66 humanitarian convoy that was put together by the representatives of the Communist Party of Russia and its uh, supporters so this is a real humanitarian aid that we provide to this region and there are specific people mostly young people who are who as members of the communist party took part in military action and some of them were even killed in donbas so i just uh, had the duty to mention this since this was raised now for the october 1917 events of course this was a coup and the bolsheviks did not hide this but this political coup was part and the starting point of the great social revolution and there is no uh, contradiction in this as you know paul uh, emperor paul the uh, first did not abdicate uh, he was killed in a coup 
and by his own family, but this did nothing to impact the political or economic processes in the country. But as for the 1917 revolutions, the February, the October revolution, these events had a major impact on the development of Russia. For this reason, the term revolution is uh, pretty pertinent. Uh, and. Uh, regarding the debate whether this was a socialist or proletarian revolution. This is also uh, a false debate because, of course, the Bolsheviks relied, mostly relied on the proletariat, although the peasant issue was also very important. So I do not see any contradictions there as well. I think uh, that uh, Alexander Zinoviev uh, was right when he said that the Soviet Union was assassinated. This was an assassination and that was I and many of my colleagues believe. There is an image and a symbol by uh, our great philosopher Alexander Zinoviev once said, if a crocodile swallows a monkey, does this does not mean uh, that a crocodile is uh, a more developed uh, organism uh, compared to the monkeys. Monkey. So if the Soviet Union uh, did not survive, that does not mean that it was not a highly organized society. It was a highly organized society. Who sh should be involved in politics? Dmitry Kolikov proposed dividing uh, the society into those who should be involved and who should not be involved. Let's recall what Lenin wrote. He wrote that people will be victims uh, of lies and uh, self lies uh, until uh, they are represent uh, locked within social groups. And there is a Lenin uh, phrase by Lenin that a uh, Kitchen workers should uh, learn to run the country. Uh, this, and in fact, Lenin said that kitchen workers should learn to do that. They should should not necessarily run the country. For the first, uh, the Soviet Union was the first country to provide political rights to women. They were able to elect and to be elected. So if you have the right to be involved in politics and to, to determine the destinies of your country. So it would be right to make sure that these people uh, know what politics is. So uh, justice is a key notion for the Soviet period. Some are proud uh, of the Soviet regime, others are not. But if we recognize the achievements of the Soviet Union, and most of you here recognize these achievements, and as what has been said today during uh, uh, previous presentations, we need to understand what is behind this effectiveness of the Soviet uh, system. And social uh, justice, of course, it was the main driver of economic and social development of our country. The uh, achievements uh, uh, of the 20th century uh, by our country, how did uh, they relate to today's uh, events? Uh, the 19th Congress of the Communist Party of China has just ended, and it was said that China's success is underpinned by liberal methods of economic governance. But if we look at the Chinese experience in more detail, uh, we see that their key priority are fighting poverty, and they've been quite successful at it, and they focused on this issue. And the documents that were adopted at the 19th Congress of the Communist Party of China, uh, they even uh, put even more emphasis on the socialist uh, agenda, and they weren't talking about building a communist society. We, so, of course, the communist and socialist ideas will remain relevant in today's world. And the latest research shows that 1% of uh, the world population 
uh, has comparable resources compared to the other 99%, the remaining 99%. So it is clear that in a world, uh, that the world is ruled by interests uh, and uh, uh, this does not, uh, should not suggest that revolution is impossible in the future. If there are problems that are adding up, that are not addressed, not resolved, uh, and if uh, the authorities are not able to offer an evolutionary alternative, uh, there can be a situation where revolution will be possible, even in the 21st century. Thank you very much. So I would lo I have a question. Uh, yes, uh, the Soviet Union was assassinated, but where were you? When someone comes uh, to your house, uh, t ties you up and takes your property. Of course, uh, you can say that uh, yes, uh, we were robbed. But if there were men in the house, if they were armed, uh, they had the power, but where were you? So is there an answer to this question? As the way you put this question, uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, attempt to avoid uh, the real uh, question, so that to say that the capitalist, uh, cro uh, this capitalist crocodile just ate the socialist mo monkey. monkey. This that does not mean that uh, the monkey is not at a higher level of evolution, but where were you? all that time. Well, there was a question uh, today that was put the following way. Uh, why did nobody uh, stand up to protect uh, the Soviet regime in 1990s? I cannot agree with that. There were people who stood up and who wanted to protect the Soviet regime. On February 23rd, uh, 1991, there was a major demonstration on the protection of the Russian army, and the army was one of those institutions uh, the, uh, that faced the most oppression during the perestroika uh, years. There were a lot of people that took to the streets in central Moscow to express their opposition. There were also other opportunities and possibilities for people to express their point of view. There was a referendum in March 1991 to preserve the Soviet Union in early 1990s. Uh, there were a lot of people who or uh, took to the streets to protest government action. All these people wanted to, to preserve the Soviet Union. And you know the situation within the party. I was not a member of the party. I was a student back then, and I could have been a party member when I served in the military, when I uh, uh, was a student and I was asked why am I, did I not join the party given my uh, position but when I explained why I did not join the party it was hard to tell who what are of the factions within the Communist Party uh, determine the course of the party the party line so whether it was Gorbachev or Yakovlev, Shevardnadze or Ligachev, so uh, those who had the reins of uh, uh, state power, uh, the, they were the traitors who uh, confessed to their treason later uh, power in the Soviet Union was centralized, quite centralized. So when at the head of the centralized system you have people who uh, commit political treason, those who do not have this possibility, it is hard to keep uh, the ship afloat. So this is what happened. So, but the question remains, in 1917, uh, we protected the country from the intervention. In 1941, uh, people protected uh, the country, but this time, all they did was just take to the streets. I'm not accusing anyone. This is not the meaning of my question. We have a conference here. But this is a serious question, for, and including for the Communist Party. What was it in the project itself of the Soviet state, of the Soviet country? 
and in the governance system how it was uh, uh, operated that it made it possible for uh, the country to be dissolved. I'm not talking about uh, who stood up for the country and who did not. What I'm asking for is for analysis of the communist project. So what did it contain? I cannot hear this answer from you. I, this is not a question just for you, but overall for the Communist Party. Uh, we did not hear this answer, uh, so how do you analyze this question? But it, I think it is high time that we get the answer. Well, of course, uh, what I will now say is more about um, political observation rather than an academic discourse. When someone tells us that you, the communist, you destroyed the Soviet Union, uh, this is uh, not uh, accurate. During the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War, when a Red Army soldier defected to the enemy, uh, everyone understood that he was a traitor of the motherland, of the party, and so on. So if you say that the communists destroyed the Soviet Union, you cannot say that the party were, were the traitors, uh, maybe those at the head of the party were the traitors, but not the party as a whole. As for the uh, destruction of the Soviet Union and the subjective and objective factors for this uh, destruction, were there any problems in terms of the development of the Soviet society? Of course, there were crisis development in, within the system, but of course, uh, we could have overcome all these issues. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, dissolution and the breakdown was not uh, predetermined uh, and could have been avoided. Uh, and uh, there was an immense crisis in the United States in the 1930s, but it did not destroy the United States. It did not bring about a socialist revolution. Uh, uh, just because Roosevelt was not a traitor, unlike Mikhail Gorbachev. So I think uh, that even though there were objective issues, real issues in the development of the Soviet Union, but the country could have dealt with these issues. Uh, so there were subjective uh, factors. Uh, as a moderator, I cannot have this discussion with you, but I believe that there were objective reasons and we need to understand them. Maybe I will later explain. There was a crisis of growth and it was surmountable. Thank you very much. Could I add a couple of words, please? Uh, I have to run right now, but I saw all those events that happened. Uh, just a couple of phrases, please. Yes, I'll be brief. Among all other things, regarding this treason, this was very similar to what happened in February 1917. And one thing that added to that reason was this huge gap between what was declared as the state ideology and um, how most of the elites really lived. So this huge gap resulted in the inevitability of the Soviet collapse, given the regime that we had. And there's the question, but what was the reason for the elites going down? The reason was the absence of the tools for self-renewal of elites in the Soviet Union. And this is exactly why this um, uh, period is called stagnation, because this all resulted uh, in the absence of uh, forced measures for renewal of uh, a new generation of elites. And unfortunately, this, is, this was what weakened the Soviet elites and caused uh, the following crisis and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So 1991 was not the reason, was the consequence. Yes, but we still have the question, what was the reason for there being no tools for self-renewal. Olga, you have the floor, please. Just uh, a couple of words, please. I'll be very brief. Thank you, Sergei. 
Alexander Zinoviev has repeatedly asked the leadership of our country, I'm talking about the Soviet Union, he's been warning them. He wrote several letters to the Soviet Communist Party even before the book Yawning Heights was written. He was worried about the country. He felt the concern of the country. He warned the leadership that the country was running into a crisis, but the Soviet leadership did not recognize such a fact. The only thing that the leadership could do was to accuse Zinoviev of panicking. Thank you, Olga. That's a very important remark, but once again I have the question, what prevented the leadership of the country from hearing Mr. Zinoviev? Because he wrote very clearly. So, once again, I give the floor to Yuri Filipov, France. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to tell you about the person who delivered dozens of books by Zinoviev to the Soviet Union. It was a very difficult thing to do because uh, Zinoviev books were banned in the Soviet Union. Or even if you could get Zinoviev then you can, could also get, a, a, or you had to get, a couple of books by Solzhenitsyn. But I'm not going to talk about that. If you permit me, I will tell you a brief concept. Alazinoviev. So we will start with the 17th century. That was when the Enlightenment started in Europe, when people became literate, and in the middle of that century. Some words appeared, like microscope, telescope, Galileo, Kepler, science started to exist, while Eurasia also had some things, it had cannons and powder, which was uh, actually invented in uh, Europe, or some say China, well, it's debatable. And there was enlightenment and culture that was developing in Europe. And Europe uh, didn't really like uh, these uh, strong hugs of Eurasia, hugging Russia. I'm just talking about Western Europe, so to say. And uh, the Western Europe just decided to change the gods in Russia. We changed our dynasty. We had the Romanovs dynasty. Then we were sick of uh, this process. And uh, then there was uh, the guy who was um, known as Peter the Great. And he came back from England after two years of studies there. And uh, he just uh, put the Russia in complete order. And Russia followed the European path of development. But in actual fact, it was under Peter the Great that a full occupational regime was introduced in Russia. Now, let's move forward to the 18th century. At the same time, on a step-by-step -step basis, there was first religious education, then there was non-religious education. And uh, this wave of enlightenment resulted in complete literacy. And uh, this literacy was in Europe. Well, it was not 100%. Uh, maybe 70% uh, of the population. That was quite enough. Uh, for great minds to appear, such as Montesquieu, D'Alembert, Voltaire, Swift, and others, as well as Friedrich uh, the Prussian, and so on. So literacy developed, enlightenment developed, as well as culture and science.
which in the middle of the 19th century, maybe in the 1830s, resulted in serious notions of social justice, which took different shapes. Some people pretended to be religious, uh, some did not, and there were different forms and shapes of this notion, social justice. Because there was about uh, 1.5 million monks and clergymen from the year 1000 till 1600. The Europeans invented a lot of such things. We are not going to delve into that. And then the structure of the nuclear reactor of social progress started to exist. What does it mean, social progress? It means that everyone should have decent living conditions, should work, should uh, gain their bread. Then there were very well-known scientists like Adam Smith. And most people who read Adam Smith did not make it to the conclusion in the sixth chapter of his book, where it was said that uh, labor, uh, hired labor, is a crime. But that's not the most important thing. So this nuclear reactor was created, it was built, and at the end of the day, and uh, there were some geopolitical issues that were considered as well. The British Empire, which uh, spread, and the sun never sat down above uh, the British Empire. And the tools of that social progress, progress there were used by progressive forces in order to take away other people's territories and uh, create colonies. So the success was about taking some things from others and appropriating them. The only exception was Russia. Because this territory was huge, and the only thing that happened there was uh, the transformation of uh, the status of the Russian colonizers. The best example is the Romanovs. Uh, there's this long German surname, and by the end of the 19th century, they were Russian patriots. But uh, the construction of the Western general human mechanism was continued, the mechanism for social justice. And it's time to use this mechanism somewhere. And now I bow to our colleague who has already departed, Mr. Zhelizniak, who said many things with which I disagree. But what I agree with is that it was this Russian territory, this part of Eurasia, where this um, production test was carried out. I fully agree with that. As for the 1917 revolution, indeed, the Soviet people celebrated this uh, anniversary for 70 years. This is why it is great, only for this reason alone. But from the very beginning, when this nuclear reactor was uh, being built, uh, I remind you that there are some graphite uh, uh, tablets uh, and other elements are introduced there, as well as uh, the steering rod. And uh, it was preserved there till the very collapse of the Soviet Union. I can't say that it was the West that uh, made the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, but there were those steering rods, the most important elements there in that mechanism. And the West made a mistake, as I see, as I see it, when it allowed the Russian leaders to play with toys that they didn't fully understand. They 
did not understand the very precious indications by Zinoviev. He wrote everything very clearly. So this is how it happened. Why the Soviet Union worked in this particular way and not in another way. This is because there were those graphite rods there. Just one example. Olga has shown us a great film with the Aurora battleship, which was great. You were great. But one question, what money was it built on? Russian money. It turns out that the smart Ministry of Finance gave a loan of 10 billion pounds to Russia. And after to see me, where there were some other measures taken, where more powerful English boats and more powerful English engines were developed and the bravery of Russian sailors alone was not able to cope with those English boats uh, who were more powerful. So all of this uh, ended with Tsushima. As a result, Russia had to buy a new fleet from England and England uh, gave a loan to Russia saying we give you 10 billion you, you should give us 10 billion pounds and you should put them into our bank at the same time Russia received a loan for 10 billion francs in France to build railways and another small fact who suggested it Robert Montague the chairman of the central bank. This was the person who gave the idea to the Russians. To pay back the Tsar debts. Even the English, the English were not concerned about it. Because a lot of uh, Russian gold money reserves uh, were in the English banks. So a lot of uh, Russian money went to English banks. So the English friends uh, tried to calm Russia down, but uh, they actually earned a lot of money. Could this process be really governed? You remember that uh, the, before the revolution, the Congress uh, of uh, so, uh, socialist parties took place in London, which confirms that this process was largely managed by the West. And I will conclude my presentation with the following. It's uh, the brief Zinoviev statement. There's the book that was shown here. It's a scary book written by a genius. And it has a monstrous prediction, which seems to be comic. This is the book Global Human Hell. And there's uh, this nut, which uh, is the main character of this book, uh, which uh, was uh, the last person who was uh, born naturally by the natural way and it was said that there are special things uh, to, to give birth to give artificial birth so this was the main character and the main tool there was the confessional tool This is a kind of uh, confessional gadget, uh, maybe Samsung, maybe iPhone, maybe iPod. And in five years, the Murphy law really worked. 
three times. What does it mean? It means uh, that every 18 months uh, the speed of processors doubles. Every 18 months memory doubles. As a result, in five years we will see a gadget which will have m many more neurons than in our brains because 10 billion neurons is uh, a small thing and it will have enough memory to store all the fairy tales, novels and books uh, ever invented by Homo sapiens. That was the prediction of Alexander Zinoviev, the huge genius. Well, I cannot fail uh, to ask you a question as well. Uh, did I understand you correctly that the entire history of Russia is a history of occupation starting from Peter the Great? And even in the Soviet period, there were this uranium uh, that, well, not entirely correctly. Yes. So, yes, the, there was a period. Uh, we live in the third iteration of these uh, times. So. We live in this uh, third period of this uh, uh, period. There, w uh, there was a period of Ivan the Terrible, uh, who was on the throne for 60 years. But these are details. So. And the f further you move, uh, the less intelligible it becomes. Uh, by the way, uh, this was a, w among the books that I promoted as, when I lived in France. Uh, there was also uh, this book about uh, free of illusions. So yes, uh, you did not get me exactly what I wanted to say. And I will be ready to answer your further questions. So. So, Mr. Baburin, please, uh, now it's your turn. Sergey Baburin, uh, distinguished Ms. Zinoviva, uh, participants of the conference, I will, I represent the party Russian All National Union, and I'm also a person who is extremely proud that I used to know and was good friends with Mr. Alexander Zinoviev. It is not a coincidence that the autumn issue of the Slaviani magazine on the October Revolution opens with an article on Zinoviev uh, where we say that the, uh, his idea that the October Revolution is the greatest event of the 20th century. We will never understand what is happening today in Russia if we do not uh, understand what happened back then in 1917. This is not an exaggeration. Today we are presented this mix between February and October Revolution and it turns out that the Bolsheviks are to blame for the abdication of the royal family, that they destroyed the empire and the whole Soviet uh, period is just a misunderstanding. This is not a lie. This is a new level of attempts uh, to destroy historical Russia. Yes, it is true that 1917 started as a palace coup when the uh, upper stratum of the liberal bourgeoisie uh, wanted to destitute the emperor and the Guch Guchkov, who had the Central Industrial Committee, started preparing the destitution of the emperor back in 1914 and he, not the Bolsheviks, but the leader of the February Revolution said that 
even if this leads to a world war, uh, our main focus should be the destitution of the emperor. And the situation when the emperor abdicated for himself and for his son and uh, the monarchy was uh, paralyzed, these, uh, uh, those behind the coup were not ready, the revolution was not ready, the uh, democratic uh, reforms were still in the making, so this led to chaos because the army wanted to protect the monarch and the fatherland. When there was no emperor anymore, they did not want to protect the provisional government. And within the first two weeks of February 76, uh, high command officers, including four admirals, were killed only on the Baltic fleet. And Bolsheviks had nothing to do with that. This was... Uh, total chaos and in the society. This is when Poland, Finland, the Baltic uh, states, Ukraine, they all fell uh, separated from Russia. When separatist Kornilov, who headed the arrest of the uh, royal family, and they, he wanted to take the power that was out there and nobody had it, uh, uh, there was an opposition, uh, and Riga was taken. There was uh, the idea that Russia will no longer exist as a single country. Of course, there is a, a lot of uh, similar things happened in 1991. So the Bolsheviks, when they came to power, so and there is a lot of uh, fake information. Uh, they were not the ones who started the civil war. They had their own program, which consisted of building a new society, whether you like it or not. But the April thesis uh, of uh, Lenin uh, was a genius uh, uh, representation of what the Bolsheviks wanted. All these structures of the uh, monarchy uh, are no longer w working. We have to have the Soviets and to proceed from there. We have to give land to peasants. We have to uh, have a single bank instead of many private banks. So this was the program and it was uh, implemented after October. And uh, the uh, uh, crackdown by the Bolsheviks was underpinned by the need to fight uh, the uh, adepts of the monarchy by, by the so just not to repeat the situation where the monarchists uh, uh, joined the red army and, and this is a fact that the mo monarchists they joined the red army not the army of those who betrayed the emperor and Kornilov and Alexeyev and Denikin and Kolchak all they all betrayed the imperial family they are now glorified but they were traitors I will move on to conclusions yes there was a civil war that followed and we have to understand the lessons of the October Revolution but uh, there was a key lesson, and Zinoviev wrote about it. You cannot live uh, with your past, but you cannot uh, uh, give up on your traditions and your national specifics. Whether you like it or not, Russia has an orthodox tradition. You can be not a religious person, but you have to understand what are the values are when our uh, Russian Orthodox uh, a Church wrote in a declaration that apart from human rights there are values that are as important as human rights such as faith, such as morality, as the sacred things, as the uh, motherland. Until uh, now uh, the power, the authorities have not been unable to hear that uh, we uh, 
have lawlessness uh, as a law. We neglect the historical Russia that we had. We talk a lot about restoring traditions, but this all runs counter to the existing constitution. When the president says that our ideology is patriotism, he forgets an article of the constitution when the, uh, there is no government ideology. And this is a lesson of the October Revolution that we must uh, learn, even if uh, we are all, already a century apart from these events. We cannot live in the past. We cannot dream about restoring the Soviet Union. We cannot uh, live uh, in the past and dream about the Russian Empire. Yes, the elite had a nice life uh, back in the days of the empire, but so it, it is now. But we have to be mindful of the ideals that helped the Bolsheviks win the civil war that made the Soviet Union uh, the a leader of social development in the world in the first half of the 20th century. The ideal of building a new just society, a new society based on happiness, on equality, on honor and dignity. These ideals should be revived and implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baburin. So, uh, please, uh, read, Mr. Ritz, you have the floor. So, uh, this is our colleague from Germany. So, I will speak in English. Be because I'm only starting to learn Russian. I would like to describe the Russian Revolution into a geopolitical context. And of course, as a German, I'm looking from the outside on, on, on this event. And I think what I would like to put in the context of the Russian Revolution is um, First, uh, the behavior of the Western world after the downfall of the Berlin Wall, which has led to NATO expansion, which was not officially planned uh, in the years of the Perestroika and Glasnost, when there was also in the West the open talk that now a time of peace has arrived and we will build a common European house. And a few years later, the process of NATO expansion starts. And the second event, which I would like to put in the context of the Russian Revolution, um, which I would like to connect with this event, is the emergence of a new kind of cultural policy in the Western world. Um, it started a little bit before the downfall of the wall, but it accelerated after the downfall of the wall. What I mean is the rise of a postmodern cultural policy. Um, uh, this is a very problematic um, um, occurrence because it is self-destructive to the Western society as well. Um, what I mean will become clearer in, uh, in the process of my speech. Um, I think um, to understand the geopolitical context of the Russian Revolution, we have to first understand that um, before the First World War, the imperial powers of, of Europe, they competed with each other on the one hand, but on the other hand, they joined their forces uh, when they wanted, for example, to sub uh, subordinate China. And if the First World War would have a slightly different outcome, if, for example, the Russian Revolution would have led to the, di uh, to the di division of Russia in different countries, which was planned at the time, as some of our colleagues have uh, today mentioned, um, then we would probably have seen during the 1920s and 1930s the continuation of the traditional European imperialism, um, which would have over the decades evolved towards a kind of joint super imperialism. And in, if this would have happened, it would have been extremely difficult for the countries of the Southern and Eastern Hemisphere, for countries like China and India and South America, um, to, to start an independent process of development. 
um, maybe it would have been absolutely impossible for those countries under such conditions. And it was only the existence of the Soviet Union, especially after the Second World War, that opened a window of opportunity for countries like China, India, and a lot of other important countries in the Southern and Eastern Hemisphere to start a process of development and, and growing independence. And when the Soviet Union resolved itself in 1991, and the armies of the Soviet Union were brought back from Eastern Germany and Hungary and Poland to, to Russia, um, a, a large a, a portion of the Western elite started to think about the possibility to go back to the time before the First World War, to now create what was back then not possible, a joint kind of European Western imperialism which would be so strong that the rest of the world couldn't stand up against it. And this this idea became no, later known as the neoconservative movement. And uh, they are in power till today, and uh, they have become weaker, weaker over the years because um, they weren't able to finish their ideas, and the Western, the Western world is in a process of economic decline. And the economic decline of the Western world is inevitable. It, it will go on for decades to come. And so this idea of a kind of Western super imperialism will never materialize. This is the good news. Uh, the bad news is that we have to understand in this context postmodernity. What is postmodernity? What is a postmodern cultural policy? It is nothing else than the attempt to alter culture, European culture, in such a way, to reinterpret it in such a way that the cultural basis for a return to socialism uh, is gone forever. What I, do I mean with it? I would like to explain it a little bit in a little bit more detail. Socialism as a concept is closely related to, to the concept of enlightenment. Socialism is basically a child of the enlightenment. And both socialism and the Enlightenment are based on some basic ideas. For example, the idea that history is a linear process, maybe sometimes through going through dialectic, um, that history has a name, that within this process of history, progress is, uh, is possible and that this progress must have a collective meaning, that it not only can be the progress of a small group. And finally, that history and truth are somehow connected and interrelated with each other. And therefore, that philosophy of history is justified and necessary. And if you look at postmodern philosophy, as it has been established by Michel Foucault, uh, Gilles Deleuze, Derrida, and many others, mostly French philosophers, we can see that they really attack this epistemological foundation of socialism, but finally even the Enlightenment itself. Um, for example, a lot of postmodern philosophies are saying that there um, is not one history, but many histories. Or, that there is not one truth, but many truths, that there is no subject which could, um, uh, rec uh, which could um, lead or make a decision in the process of history, um, uh, that if somebody tries to connect or tries to think together processes of history and, and truth, then this means to be, so quote, totalitarianism and so forth. So, we can go through the, the basic assumptions of postmodern philosophy and therefore also postmodern cultural policy, and we always find that they try to reverse the basic assumption of socialism, which are to a large extent overlapping with the, um, with the ideas of the Enlightenment itself. So the attack, the epistemological attack on socialism becomes finally an attack on the Enlightenment itself, and therefore on one of the 
most important foundation of European culture as such. And this, um, we see in the last 20 to 30 years, this postmodern cultural policy um, was more and more implemented in, in the whole Western world. It has become to some extent self-destructive. The country where I come from, uh, Germany, um, has now decided that uh, Germany should not have uh, closed borders anymore and that we now will become a multi-ethnic society. Um, this goes, this is maybe not a very health, healthy decision, um, but nevertheless it was implemented because it promised some benefits for a small minority of people. The benefit that if these basic assumptions I just mentioned are no longer present in the public mind, then the, the cultural foundation for socialism is basically gone. And while the project of the Western world to, to create um, a unipolar world order with the Western world in its center, this project has basically failed on an economic basis and it has also failed on a military basis. But it was to some extent successful on a cultural basis. And now we are in a huge contradiction. On the one hand, the the Western world is too weak to, to fully um, bring, uh, to, fill, to fully um, implement their plans. On the other hand, the, the attack on the basic assumptions of European culture has been so severe and so successful that we are now on a global scale lacking the, uh, the, the consciousness to, to, um, to recreate something new to, to, to return to the original European culture or to recreate something that would be within the tradition of European culture. And this is a very um, difficult and dangerous um, situation. And at the end, I would like to make one remark towards a question that came up during our discussion concerning uh, what happened in 1991 with the Soviet Union. Um, I, as a German, cannot speak about the domestic policy of the Soviet Union, but what I can say from a Western perspective is that I think that the Western world was, during the Cold War, very successful to use culture as a weapon, to, um, to promote a specific cultural policy, to combine the Cold War with the cultural policy. And this um, Western cultural policy, which finally turned into postmodern cultural policy, um, was successful to convince a fraction of the Russian society and maybe a meaningful fraction of the Russian elite so that they started to feel a kind of crisis of, of belief, a, a crisis of, of confidence um, concerning the promises of socialism. And maybe this was one of the reasons why um, uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union occurred. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ritz. Thank you, Ritz. I think it was a very important point. The thing that you mentioned, it's not so simple, this postmodernist movement. And uh, as I understand, uh, there is uh, the attempt to really erase the actual memory of uh, socialism and its uh, possibilities. Uh, and it is uh, very relevant uh, in the context of what Zinoviev wrote, that we are in a situation of uh, uh, civilizational war, uh, evolutional war, and there is this struggle between various evolutionary lines uh, of uh, mankind. And uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, all the attacks against Russia within this context, it needs to be considered within the context you mentioned, the evolutionary context. Uh, right now, there is an ongoing attempt uh, to put up a barrier for evolutional change of humanity. This is how I understood what you meant. Thank you. Oleg Nazarov.
I will be very brief because we don't have much time. I'm not going to talk about the perestroika of uh, Gorbachev, of Yeltsin. I'm going to talk about the meaning and origins of the Russian Revolution. And there are three points that uh, need to be discussed separately. The first one, we have gathered together one week before the 100th uh, anniversary of uh, the October Revolution. This term is not used here. And this is innovation of uh, the last few years uh, when both Russian revolutions uh, were considered as uh, one single thing. This uh, point of view that this was one whole revolution which uh, lasted from February till October and it had uh, three stages, the February Revolution, the October Revolution and the Civil War. It's not a new idea, by the way. And uh, I read uh, this uh, in the works of Mr. Bukharin and uh, he had uh, an even more ambitious idea. For example, the creation of the coalition government in May 1917, that is, uh, there was uh, the government of liberals and Kerensky, who was half liberal, half socialist. Uh, and this is how he made his political career in 1917. And you know how it finished, right? And the second stage was in May with uh, the establishment of the coalition government, where uh, there were members uh, from uh, three parties uh, which uh, were part of that coalition. That's how Bukharin looked at this. This is another interpretation of that revolution. And now about the origins of the revolution. The idea was mentioned several times today that February was uh, the um, uh, decision of the elites. Uh, and uh, actually, we can't uh, fully say that. We can't say that this was the conspiracy of the elites, because the February Revolution started uh, with uh, the manifestation of the demonstration of women who went to the streets. Uh, and this was a mass protest on the 27th of uh, February. There was uh, the military mutiny which added to this process. And as a result, uh, the conspiracy of the elites uh, was not uh, concluded uh, with uh, a new Tsar being elected, uh, but uh, as a result, under the pressure of uh, the grassroots uh, layers of the society, the revolution went further, and it went very far. I'm going to quote uh, Alexander Zinoviev, who is uh, well known for being exiled from the Soviet Union. Actually, I'm going to quote another philosopher who was also exiled, Mr. Berdyaev. And this is what he said when staying abroad about the origins and the reasons of the revolution. It is uh, the most reactional forces of the old regime that are responsible for the revolution, the autocracy actually collapsed by itself, end of quote. Berdyaev talked and wrote about social justice for a reason, because uh, our people were always concerned about social justice, and the majority of the population considered their current situation as unjust, and this feeling of injustice became one of the basic points uh, for the crisis of the 1917 and the following years. This feeling of injustice uh, had its reasons as well. I will just mention the most important ones. Uh, of course, uh, I can talk for a lot of time about each of them. The main reason was that there were a lot of peasants in Russia, and they believed it unjust that most of the land is owned uh, by um, those who do not work on this land. Uh, and um, the peasants were critical of the current situation. They did not like uh, the emperor's Russia. We can also read a lot uh, about 
the situation of the workers. Of course, uh, some workers were well-to-do, for example, those who worked for the entrepreneur Konovalov, but most workers had a very hard life. For example, under Nicholas II, uh, finally, uh, a limit was put to the duration of the working day. And before that, the working day was 16 hours. And at the end of uh, the 19th century, it was 11.5 hours. That was real achievement. And it was like that uh, until the end of uh, the Tsar's rule. And the workers uh, disliked it, of course. They wanted uh, to make their working day shorter. And uh, it was also improvement of the living standards and the working conditions of uh, the workers. They wanted their working conditions to get better. About 400 articles uh, were written about that. One of them was about the mutiny in the Central Asia. And you can read in those articles uh, what horrors happened there. And, uh, Actually, it was provoked uh, by the wrongful manuscript of uh, Nicholas II himself. Uh, the living conditions were very poor. They needed to be radically changed. For example, child mortality was t more than 27% in Russia. In Germany, it was 185 uh, in the United States, less than 10. In Great Britain, it was 14 twice as, well, that was half uh, less. Uh, and uh, the rate of literacy of the population. In Russia, per 1,000 people, 211 were literate. That is 21%. And I will highlight separately that it's not the data taken from the Bolshevik leaflets. It's from the report of the Minister of Education. Of course, no minister will make his indicators worse than the real ones. I think uh, this number is even better than what the reality was. But if we look at this literacy percentage, 21%, compared uh, to Germany, it's really bad, because in Germany, 980 persons out of uh, 1,000 were literate. Austria-Hungary, 944, and all other civilized countries had about 900 persons who were literate. I also did a lot of interviews with uh, Alexander Zinoviev, uh, for example, regarding the Great Patriotic War, and I asked him, how did it happen that the Soviet Union defeated uh, the entire continental Europe, not just Germany and its satellites. Uh, and at the beginning of the war, we gave a lot of people and resources to Germany. We just fought with uh, what remained. He named a lot of reasons, and one of them was education. He said that the Soviet Union resolved the issue of illiteracy, of uh, people, because World War II was the war of engines. People needed to understand how to fly t um, airplanes, how to drive tanks. Mr. Zinoviev was himself a pilot. And uh, the fact that the Soviet Union resolved the issue of illiteracy within just 20 years, uh, while the emperor's Russia wasn't able to resolve it within 300 years. Uh, this is why the Soviet Union won the war, and this is why we are sitting here with you today. That's the price of uh, this issue. So this February revolution is not just about conspiracy. It's just a cherry on the cake, the icing on the cake. But there were fundamental issues that were not resolved for decades. There was the second layer, the management errors made by Nicholas II throughout his leadership. For example, the constant reshuffling of the ministers. And during World War I, some of the territory was occupied, and Nicholas II 
Second, uh, kept, uh, kept shuffling the ministers of the interior, the, uh, the military ministers, and a lot of other ministers. And also, a lot of area was conquered and something needed to be done there. And it was uh, called uh, the ministerial reshuffling. And Nicholas II showed himself uh, as uh, a weak manager. He was uh, unable to put up with strong prime ministers. There were just two or three of them throughout uh, his uh, rule. And they were not uh, at power in 1917. And furthermore, the war, the mistakes of the eight days of the February Revolution. Just look, uh, Nicholas II uh, went uh, to his residence uh, on the 22nd, and it all started on the 23rd. So he was, uh, he had the title of Commander-in-Chief, but when he went to his residence, uh, he left uh, all his leaders uh, in Petrograd, uh, like Galitsyn, Protopopov, uh, the military minister Belayev, uh, the mayor of Petrograd, General Habalov, and the leader of uh, the state Duma Radzankin, the leader of the upper chamber of the parliament, all of them remained in Petrograd, and they were unable to cope with the situation. Moreover, they took decisions which even made the situation worse. Suffice it to say that when there were issues with bread, you can just read in newspapers what it was about. They said that they had planned it in Petrograd, but just read regional newspapers of January, February 1917, any newspapers. You can see that there were a lot of problems with bread and no Bolshevik propaganda at all. What happened in Petrograd was just one private case. It was not the entire problem, just one small part of it. And the cabinet of ministers could not invent anything, but they passed this problem on to the mayor. And on the 26th, during the bloody Sunday, the troops started to shoot at the demonstrants. And uh, there were people who were killed. On the next day, the soldiers refused to shoot uh, at people. And uh, this was named as uh, the military mutiny, because if a soldier refuses to fulfill the order of his chief, the soldier goes to the tribunal or gets a bullet in the head. And this is why the regiments started a mutiny, and uh, then riots started. Uh, and at the end of the day, Nicholas II wrote in his diary, there is treason everywhere, and this surprises me. Lenin could not do any treason to Nicholas II or Trotsky because they were not his officials. They never got any posts. It's uh, just uh, people who are trusted that can be traitors. So when Nicholas II said there is treason everywhere, it turns out that uh, the people who were appointed as uh, his trusted people were not able to cope with the tasks, and they turned out to be traitors. Thank you very much, Oleg, for this very interesting and important presentation, because we are often talking about some cliches in terms of what happened in 1917. And we need to really analyze those events without any propaganda, without any ideology. And it is uh, the professional historical work and historical knowledge, uh, the framework that should be the most important part of that process. Without this, we can't get anywhere. And this work was just presented by Oleg Nazarov. Thank you very much. Just a couple of words about this issue, which was the backbone of uh, both panel's discussions. So what happened in October 1917? And why all of it stopped? In, why did all of this stop in 1991? I'll be very brief. 
please pay attention to the following. It was not just the collapse of the autocracy that happened in February 1917. It was not by October 1917 that the bourgeois government collapsed. Uh, the foundations of the government as itself uh, disappeared. The power of the Romanovs uh, was on two pillars. The first pillar was the faith, the belief uh, that the Tsar is appointed by God. And secondly, there was uh, this um, military aristocracy. And uh, this is how they governed the territory. It is thanks to them that we defend them. But then this disappeared. By February 1917, the second factor disappeared as well. It was not the Tsar himself, but the very foundation that disappeared. After that, very quickly, just within a few months, the bourgeois government uh, went its own path. And because of that, Russia leaped into the future. What I mean was this oligarchy power. That's another foundation of the power, the power of money. We rule because we have money. Yes, uh, we rule through democracy. You can elect uh, the one whom we will show to you, whom we'll, we will promote, and we will make you love this person, and you will vote for this person. But it is the money that rules. Uh, those uh, who run this political machine, who can fi find unit, they can make you vote for a specific person. And Russia finished this path within several months. So this oligarchy just didn't have any foundation. And what does it mean, the Bolsheviks taking the power and holding it? It was not just uh, the fact that there was such an organized group, uh, but what they presented to the, uh, to the country was a completely different uh, foundation of uh, power, knowledge. We, the Bolsheviks, will rule, and you will be subordinate. You will report to us with enthusiasm on your own will. But any real power is not about violence. It's always voluntary. People want to be ordered. People want to be subordinates. So, we, the Bolsheviks, will rule you and will obey us, and you will do so enthusiastically because we know how to build an inclusive and just society because no one knows, but we know. We have the knowledge. We are armed with uh, Marxian uh, philosophy. We uh, have the most advanced European project, so we will develop the country, and your role is to support us and to show, display enthusiastic support and I think this is uh, the uh, universal significance uh, of the great Russian Revolution and what the Bolsheviks did so uh, Mr. Ritz I could um, a debate with you. It is not just about enlightenment and goes far deeper into history. The project of this history, this idea is built on knowledge. It was Plato who was first to propose this idea, the idea of a city state. The state for Plato is built on the idea of well-being that overcomes egoism and egoistic uh, aspirations uh, as uh, the governor improves uh, the well-being his own well-being by improving the well-being for all the subject so this uh, goes to the roots of the European culture so this Bolshevik project was deeply rooted in European culture this is the most radical uh, project inspired by Plato so now what happened in 1991 
Uh, what, uh, as was said today, this, uh, for 70 years, this was a very successful project, and this led to its demise. They failed to understand, and I'm speaking about the Communist Party, about the Bolsheviks, and they still fail to understand, as we heard today from the representative of the Communist Party, they did not understand what it means to build a country and to hold to power based on knowledge. This means that on every stage, say every five years, that you have to criticize this knowledge, that you have to change it. Social life is not like physics, where uh, you have some laws and they always work, no matter what. Uh, in the social world, uh, things work differently. We did something based on our knowledge, the situation had changed, so on the next stage we need new knowledge and new approaches. What Kulikov said, we need to dem have democratic life and democratic communications within the party and to uh, question, always question your knowledge. You cannot, uh, uh, you have to always change it to make sure that this knowledge evolves. And uh, the history of uh, the Zinoviev uh, uh, family, of the philosopher and his wife, uh, this is what he said, that if you would have listened, if you listened to me, uh, the Soviet power would have been stronger. Yes, the Soviet uh, power was not ready to listen. They had the secular religion uh, as a regime, uh, and they did not want the truth, because social truth, uh, what matters the most is how you find it. You have to always question yourselves. And this goes for social sciences in general. Our knowledge, our perspective change. Every, so every five years you have to go back and to ask questions and to rethink your approaches. This is what we wanted to understand. Ms. Uh, Zinoviev, we had 90 minutes. We were late, one, uh, uh, 90, uh, 20 minutes. So now we're finished on time. Thank you, uh, everyone. Maybe Ms. Zinoviev, you'll have some uh, announcement how we will proceed. So uh, now uh, it is 4 p.m. So we will have a coffee break. Yes, is that right? Yes, yes, we have a coffee break. And after that, uh, we'll have the next uh, session. So we have a breakaway session uh, of the youth. And uh, then we'll have the third. Uh, session at uh, 4.45 uh, p.m. on the idea of the Russian Revolution in the international context. This is a roundtable discussion by International in Intellectual Club Zinoviev. I would just want to conclude with one phrase. I really like the proposals by Giulietta Chiesa to create a special international project so that uh, and we have their platform, we have the International Intellectual Club Zinoviev, and we could use it as a platform to discuss and to take decisions uh, for uh, that would be relevant for the governments of the countries that are uh, willing to listen to us. This is the purpose of our intellectual club, of course. Thank you.